Hello and welcome to our second Leadership Circles presentation of Legends of the Halls for 2021. I'm Luke Swetland here at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, and we're excited you could join us this evening. Now, our Legends of the Hall series focuses on interesting past events and people at the museum and the impacts they have had in shaping who we are today. During this evening's presentation, please feel free to ask any questions you may have through the Q&A tab you can find at the bottom of your screen. And we'll get to as many of them as possible at the close of the program. Tonight's program, entitled Legends of the Halls, Wash the Shore, the museum's blue whale skeleton, brings the story of the museum's blue whale to life from its first discovery on a beach at Vandenberg to today as a valued educational icon of our museum. As you all know, our blue whale skeleton is named Chad. And I wanna start our program by sharing the story of how this, the largest specimen in our collection earned that name. Now, back in 2010, the museum realized that our whale skeleton needed serious restoration work. And so we launched a campaign to raise half a million dollars that would enable us to dismantle the skeleton to perform conservation work on each bone and then to re-articulate the entire skeleton into a more anatomically correct diving posture. For this campaign, the museum's development committee wanted to invite members of the community to make gifts to the campaign by adopting a specific bone. Doug Dreyer, a member of the committee and a trustee of the museum was very excited about the chance for his family to make a leadership level gift to the project. After talking it over with his folks, Chad and Ginny, the Dreyer family stepped up with the lead gift of $100,000. The museum in turn liked the idea of naming the skeleton Chad, the name that is part of the full name of three generations of Dreyer men. Now, sadly, we lost Chad Dreyer in 2019. But today, Chad the Blue Whale welcomes each and every visitor to the museum and is often the agreed upon meeting point for guests. Chad is a local destination in its own right. And our whale even has its own Twitter account. Now think about how extraordinary it is to be able to arrive at the museum and to view and then to be able to touch a real skeleton of the largest animal ever known to have lived on earth, an animal that still swims in our channel just three miles down the watershed. As a specimen, Chad raises the stature and visibility of our museum to a national level. And I can't imagine anything that could serve as a finer legacy for Chad Dreyer than his namesake, our blue whale. So now let's go back to the beginning of the story. And for that, I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, Paul Collins, Emeritus Curator of Vertebrate Zoology. Paul, take it away. Well, good evening. Um... I get to uh, introduce you to the history of our uh, blue whale, uh, which is uh, a long and storied history. Um, we've had uh, this blue whale for the past 40 years. So tonight, um, I'm gonna cover the history of our original blue whale, uh, the discovery, its recovery, the cleaning, the repair, and the exhibition. Um, I'm also gonna uh, talk about the damages that occurred to the skeleton uh, during the 27 years it was exposed to the sun and moisture and the wear and tear from humans uh, being able to kind of climb around uh, the skeleton while it was on exhibit. And then the history of the replacement of the blue whale skull, the new skull that we got, um, the recovery and cleaning of that skull, and then the restoration of the original blue whale skeleton, the cleaning, the repair, the stabilization of the original uh, skeleton that we kept, and then the remounting and exhibition. And then finally, I'm gonna end with uh, some stats about Chad. So the story starts back in uh, 7th of August, uh, 1980, uh, when a call came into the museum uh, in the Ver Department of Vertebrate Zoology to Brian Arnold, who's, uh, this is a picture of him down by the blue whale. 
um, that there was a blue whale that had stranded on, on a, in a remote stretch of beach on South Vandenberg Air Force Base. Well, it happened during a time when uh, Chuck Woodhouse, the curator of vertebrate zoology and myself um, were both out of the office. Chuck was on vacation and I was finishing up a month's uh, research trip to museums on the East Coast as part of my master's work. Uh, but I got a call while I was at the Smithsonian from Brian uh, one morning. And he said, Paul, there's a blue whale on the beach. What shall we do? <laughs> and it was the week before I was due to uh, get back to the museum. And uh, Chuck was also due back at the museum uh, the following week. And I said, Brian, uh, we'll have to wait on a decision on what to do about the blue whale. But in the meantime, can you put together a crew and get up and uh, see about uh, measuring and uh, doing the basic statistics and uh, necropsy work on this carcass uh, before we get back? So after, after we returned uh, to the office, uh, um, this is Brian Arnold uh, with the crew that he pulled together uh, that week uh, to uh, do a basic necropsy on, on the blue whale. And it gives you an idea on how big this carcass was um, uh, when you have uh, full grown adults standing next to it and on it. Um, after Chuck got back, uh, he assembled the crew and we went up to the, uh, the animal and uh, took, took a look at it and, um, and determined that it was uh, intact and it was probably gonna be an animal that we could uh, potentially harvest the skeleton from. And that decision was made in consult with the uh, director at the time, Dr. Dennis Power. So the challenges for uh, working on a specimen uh, of this size, first off, it's big, uh, 72 feet long, uh, up, upwards of 80 to 100 tons. Uh, total body weight. It was on a remote stretch of beach on South Vandenberg Air Force Base, so uh, north of us, and it was difficult to get to. Uh, the carcass ended up at the, the base of a 100-foot cliff on a rocky stretch, on a stretch of rocky intertidal, and it was had been degrading for uh, over a couple of weeks because it had uh, been seen the week before it washed in, uh, floating out off of uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base. So it's an awful stinky job. Uh, we couldn't get heavy equipment down to the site uh, because of the remote stretch of the beach and there was no access for heavy equipment. So all of the work to recover the skeleton had to be done by hand. And that meant hand crank come alongs, uh, chains, knives, blubber hooks, uh, and the recovery of the skeleton, getting the bones out of this carcass took us six to eight weeks uh, to accomplish. Uh, each day when we went up to the carcass, uh, we loaded up in the museum's carryall. Um, uh, with our equipment and the personnel uh, drove up to the site and then we had a, a winch a cable uh, on the front of the uh, vehicle that we could use to get down the cliff with ourselves and our equipment. Uh, we had to hit the uh, beach at a time when uh, the tide was out uh, so that we could work on the carcass. At the end of the day before the tide came in, we had to winch everything back up the cliff, including ourselves, load everything, including the rotten stinky bones and the carryall with us and ride back to the museum. Uh, and deposit the, uh, uh, the treasures of the day uh, in the parking lot behind the lab. So this went on for six to eight weeks. Uh, towards the end, you can see what the carcass looked like uh, as we're carving away, trying to get some of the uh, caudal and lumbar vertebrae out of the remaining part of the carcass. Um, the last uh, big things to come out of the carcass were the skull and lower mandibles, and they were too big to be able to be hauled up the cliff by our uh, winch on the front of the GMC. So we had to hire a, cane, a, a crane truck uh, to hook onto these things, winch them up, and help load them into uh, uh, the museum's dump truck at that time. And uh, this is a few pictures of that process. And interesting here on the lower left corner is Waldo Abbott, who was the retired curator of vertebrate zoology at that time. He couldn't uh, help but come up and help out. And he drove the, came up on the dump truck and helped direct uh, loading of the dump truck. So at the end of that six to eight weeks, this is what we had uh, in the back of the parking lot. And here's Chuck Woodhouse, uh, again, the curator of vertebrate zoology at that time, uh, kind of perusing and looking at this pile of uh, rotten, stinky bones uh, that were laying in the, in the parking lot directly behind our lab here at the museum uh, in the space where the uh, new butterfly pavilion currently sits. And Chuck's kind of wondering, what have, I, what have we gotten ourselves into <laughs> now that we've harvested all of the bones? Well, uh, that was our maceration tank at the time, not very big. Uh, and we knew that we, in order to prepare the specimen, we had to gear up uh, and get the, uh, the right equipment so that we could work on uh, cleaning, uh, cleaning the bone, uh, which was the first step. And so again, awful, stinky 
process to do this. We needed specialized equipment, which meant a, ga a gantry with a chain hoist so we can lift the heavy bones. We needed to get fiberglass tanks, uh, large fiberglass tanks that we could soak the bones in with, in a process called maceration, where we rot tissue off of the bone. And then we needed to get a steam cleaner that we could use to heat, heat and get steam and, uh, uh, into the bone in order to help draw out the oil that's inside of the bone. And then we needed a trailer to be able to move uh, to assemble the larger bones and haul haul that, those bones uh, around and onto the site where we're going to uh, install them. Uh, this process of cleaning the skeleton, all of those bones, it took one and a half years to complete. Uh, and it was about a thousand uh, plus man hours of effort uh, from volunteers, the vertebrate staff, Chuck Woodhouse, uh, and then uh, Chuck also hired an assistant, Jim Greaves. So th these are a few pictures of just this process of uh, steam cleaning in the back parking lot. Uh, you can see this steel gantry in the left picture, which Chuck built, uh, which allowed us with a chain hoist to be able to lift the heavy bone. This is a maceration tank that we could fill with water and then soak the bones in, uh, pull a bone out, uh, bring it out and then steam the surface of the bone that had been soaking in order to get remaining tissue off of it and oil out of the bone. And these are just some pictures of that steam cleaning process. Here's Jim Greaves here on the left, who was hired uh, to assist Chuck in the prep in the cleaning, uh, repair, and uh, installation of this blue whale skeleton originally. And then here's Chuck Woodhouse again, steam cleaning some of the ribs. So after the bones were cleaned, the next next process on this was uh, repairing the skeleton because we had a lot of broken bones associated with the skeleton because of the sheer weight of the animal laying on the uh, rocky intertidal. It crushed on uh, bones, uh, the thinner bones, and so. We had to reconstruct uh, missing parts, pieces that we didn't find uh, in the process of trying to recover the skeleton out of this carcass. We had to repair breaks and cracks and other damages evident on the bone. And then we had to paint and repair the bone. This process of skeleton repair took us eight to 10 months uh, of additional work. And this is just an example here in the upper left uh, corner. You can see all of these uh, pieces of bone. That, those are the vertical, vertical processes on the vertebral column that were broken. Here's the ribs. You can see some of the breaks on the ribs right here. Uh, we were missing one floating rib and we only had half of one floating rib. And then uh, here's, here's the, uh, the flipper uh, reassembled. So um, once the bones were clean, they came into the lab and it was a giant bone yard in, in, the, center, in the center lab uh, in the building. And that's where all of this repair work took place. This lower left picture here is a, uh, one vertebrae and it shows all of the broken elements on that one vertebrae that were matched up to that uh, particular vertebrae. And those had to be reassembled and reattached onto that vertebrae and the breaks had to be repaired. Um, and that process um, was labor intensive. So this is just a, a, a couple of uh, pictures of showing what we did on a vertebrae that had a bunch of breaks. And you can see the bones had to match, be matched up, uh, attached by steel rods, missing pieces or fragments had to be uh, re recreated uh, with foam. And then uh, those spaces above the foam core and uh, to smooth this all out, we use Bondo, which is the material you use uh, to repair cars. Um, so the, ne the next, after the bones were repaired, uh, the next process was engineering a support uh, for the skeleton. Uh, we had to get uh, building permits. We had to design and build a pipe and steel framework to support the skeleton. Reassemble the skeleton on a steel on the steel supports, and again that whole process of uh, reassembling this took uh, three to four months. So this is what the site looked like where the uh, blue whale is currently um, placed. This is before uh, construction started. Um, the first thing to be uh, reassembled and uh, put on site was the uh, the skull and lower mandibles, and this is just showing that process using the trailer, ultimately getting uh, the the skull up on it, reassembled and then out to the site so that it could be lifted into place. Uh, GTE uh, donated the uh, uh, services of uh, one of their uh, crane operators to come in and help us um, lift the skull up onto the steel support structure. So the first, first part of the skeleton uh, that went on site, and that's what it looked like from a distance kind of looking at it. Um, and then it was a process over the course of the next uh, six weeks of uh, reassembling the rest of that skeleton, slowly uh, putting it back on. We had to uh, uh, get the concrete forms uh, to, that are gonna support the steel structures uh, poured and uh, uh, additional steel posts put in before we could extend additional vertebral uh, parts of the skeleton. 
This shows the vertebral column kind of slowly coming out. Um, there were five total uh, support columns. This is the uh, end of the uh, tail uh, getting put on. And we use the, uh, again, our, our gantry uh, as a way to lift uh, bone up into place uh, before we attached it onto the, uh, onto the pipe structure that was supporting the vertebral column. And again, here's uh, Chuck Woodhouse on the left and Jim Greaves on the right uh, and, the, and that process of putting this back together. The ribs are on, they're working on the, uh, on the front flipper at this point. And this is what the skeleton looked like uh, when it went out on exhibit in the fall of 1983, three years after it washed in. So it took three years from the uh, time it washed in before it was on exhibit. Um, and this is a postcard of, with the kids around the uh, skeleton. So there's, uh, when you put bone out on exhibit, uh, it, it, it's, it's like wood. It's affected uh, and can degrade over time. Uh, and there, there are a lot of processes that affect the bone. Uh, the physical and chemical processes that are used to clean the bone uh, can cause damage to the bone. Interaction between the bone and the materials that are used in the repair or the attachment of uh, the bone to a metal support structure can damage the bone over time. Exposure, a direct exposure to sunlight for, or the adult, uh, ultraviolet radiation uh, can really damage the bone uh, as well as moisture and uh, that comes from rain and dew that can get down into, uh, into the bone. The fluctuating temperatures and relative humidity, expansion and contraction of the bone, just like wood does. And then uh, the human interactions with the bone over time uh, cause wear and tear on the bone. So uh, we did a condition assessment uh, tw uh, about 27 years after this uh, skeleton had been on exhibit. And um, there were a lot of things that we found during that condition assessment. The loss of the dense protective outer uh, layer of the bone caused the exposure of the inner core cancellous uh, bone um, to become exposed. And that broke down a lot more readily once it was exposed. There were uh, broken and cracked bones that were exposed. Uh, missing protective coatings on the processes of the vertebrae and tips of the ribs cause breakdown of the bone, and then cupping and delamination of the bone. This is uh, some pictures of the skull at that point during that uh, evaluation. You can see a lot of damage on the bone. Uh, the, uh, things were peeling off the surface of the bone that had been attached originally, originally onto the bone. And we determined that uh, we couldn't repair the existing skull. We we're going to need to uh, get a hold of a, another skull and another a lower mandibles. So again, this is in 14th of November, 2007, when we did this condition assessment. Again, you can see the wear and tear uh, on the bone, uh, the inner core structure really breaking down. You really can't attach pain onto that and expect it to stick. So you have to repair the bone. You have to harden the bone uh, before you can actually, uh, and then rebuild it uh, before you can repaint it. So a lot, a lot of repairs had to take place. These are some examples of the metal going through the ribs uh, and then the, material separating and exposing the uh, underlying bone underneath. So in the interim, um, once we did the assessment, we made the recommendation that uh, we needed to cover the skeleton uh, as a way to protect it uh, during the time frame that it was gonna take to raise the money in order to do a rehabilitation process and restoration of the blue whale skeleton. So this restoration process uh, basically had three phases. Phase one was to prepare a new skull and mandibles, uh, which was uh, under our purview of our work. Phase two was to clean, stabilize, repair, paint, and reassemble the postcranial skeleton and the new skull and mandibles that uh, we end up pre uh, preparing for this uh, 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 redo of the skeleton. And this was an exhibits firm that we hired from uh, uh, the Bay Area Academy Studios uh, had that part of the work. And then uh, it, uh, prepare new exhibit panels and a new subsurface under this, the skeleton. Again, that was in uh, the museum's uh, responsibilities in this uh, restoration process. So we wanted to, uh, the objectives were to stabilize and repair the postcranial skeleton. So fix all of those problems with the bone. Uh, replace any, ex uh, the existing skull and mandibles with a new skull and uh, lower mandibles. And replace any missing bones uh, with cast replicas. Uh, correct any anatomical positioning uh, of, of parts of the skeleton that were incorrectly uh, positioned in the original mount. And that included the mandibles, flippers, ribs, sternum, and hyoids and then provide a new stronger armature for supporting the skeleton with fewer vertical posts, and then finally update the exhibit content and panels. Well, lo and behold, on the 14th of September, 2007, uh, we got a call uh, that uh, a blue whale was uh, washing in uh, between Rincon and Ventura along the coast there uh, at a place called just south of Hobson County Park. 
This is a picture of the whale when we arrived on site. It was still uh, washing around at high tide and you can't get down to the carcass to work on it during that condition. So um, we ended up having to wait. <laughs> and while we waited, uh, there were more and more people and more and more cars coming and stopping uh, uh, to, uh, to have a look at this blue whale. The word, word got out, people were stopping up on 101. The train even slowed down when it came by uh, going northbound uh, to, for people to have a look at this whale. Uh, the cheerleaders even gave, uh, got out to have a look at it on their way to one of their games. And we finally had a chance to get down on the whale late in the afternoon to do what's called a necropsy, which is basically to gather uh, basic core data off of this uh, animal measurement information, and then uh, to do uh, to look into the causes for the death of this animal. And we did that that afternoon. Um, and we also talked with the county, uh, uh, Ventura County uh, Public Works. They wanted to have some assistance with. Uh, helping them uh, to, to po uh, get rid of this whale uh, carcass. Um, and, but they couldn't get their equipment down on this stretch of beach. And so uh, the arrangement was made with them to, uh, uh, at high tide to arrange to have the uh, carcass towed back out down the coast and let it loose so that it would wash in on a stretch of beach where they could get heavy equipment down to it. And in exchange for helping them carve this animal up, uh, they agreed to help us with uh, with getting the skull and lower mandibles out of the carcass uh, so that we could uh, salvage that part of the carcass uh, for the blue whale uh, restoration. And so the, the next day after the carcass had been towed down and washed in, and as the tide was going out, we got started on carving the carcass up. It wasn't until late in the afternoon that the tide was far enough out that we could actually work on the skull. And that went into the evening hours, uh, actually uh, working with the heavy equipment operators uh, and uh, carving on the carcass, we were able to remove uh, the pieces and parts of the skull um, and using the heavy equipment to uh, create the tension, uh, we were able to remove things and bring them all the way to the back part of the beach. And this just shows you right into the evening hours we were working, they brought in lights in order to allow us to be able to continue to work on the carcass. And in the meantime, during this day while we were working on it, uh, Michelle Berman, who was running our Marine Mammal Stranding Program at the time, had uh, worked out an arrangement with uh, a, a crane uh, company to come in the next day to help us with transporting the skull off the beach. And this is at the end of that first day, uh, first day of uh, uh, extracting all of the uh, skull and lower mandibles. And you can see me here uh, kind of covered in goo head to toe uh, by the end of the, uh, uh, that process. Uh, very stinky, had to throw away all those clothes at the end of that. So the next morning uh, we show up on site, uh, especially crane came in with a flatbed truck and a crane, and they were able to uh, lift all of these bones off onto the flatbed truck, strap them down, and then drive them up the coast on 101, all the way up to the Gaviota area to the old Vista Del Mar school site. Um, and when we got to the Vista Del Mar school sky, site, uh, they were able to come in, unload all of the bones. We put them on the old um, uh, basketball, uh, uh, pad. Um, and that's what they, what it looked like um, when we got that all unloaded the second day. Um, all of the bones of the skull were laying there. And you can see there's a lot of tissue left on some of this, uh, some, some of these uh, lower mandibles. Well, two years later, uh, we had to go through a fundraising effort to come up with the money in order to do the restoration work and to prepare this uh, skull. And it's, it took us two years to go through that process of raising the money. So 15th of September, 2009, this is what that skeleton looked like. Um, uh, still sitting on the, on the uh, asphalt pad uh, out of Gaviota, um, nothing done to it uh, except for the elements getting at it. Even the wood rats moved into the uh, cranial cavity of the, uh, of the uh, cranium, uh, the, the skull. And so what we had to do at that point, once we got funding was to, uh, move all of our equipment uh, up to that site and set up the site so that we could prepare the skull. We had to bring our tanks up. We had to get a, a container to be able to house our equipment um, and uh, basically get set up. We had to get a new steam cleaner because uh, our old one had, had uh, worn out. And this is the new steam cleaner we got, had to get it hauled up there. Um, and then uh, we had to get a whole new maceration tank big enough to take these large bones in order to soak the bones. And so we had a new, uh, uh, fiberglass tank built, and this is a uh, lower mandibles getting uh, lowered into that, that tank uh, where we could soak them in water, which was one of the ways that we could, uh, over time, uh, prepare that, uh, those large bones. 
So this is the 3rd of December, 2009, first day of starting to steam uh, some of the bone. This is the uh, cranium. Uh, this is Peter Gady, who was, uh, we hired to uh, help us uh, prepare the skeleton uh, or the, to prepare the skull. And he and I worked on this uh, uh, skull preparation for about eight months uh, to prepare these bones. And again, this is Peter Gady. This shows you the gantry set up with the uh, with a uh, electric chain hoist this time to be able to lift these heavy bones in and out of the tanks and move them around. Uh, this is the, just to show you the process, this is the start in the uh, upper left corner, what it looked like when uh, we first got started, the first day of steaming. Uh, this is uh, later in the process of steaming, and this is when the uh, cranium is finally finished after soaking and steaming, soaking and steaming. We finally got all of the oil out of the bone and all of the tissue off the outer surface. And here it is getting lowered down. Uh, uh, and then ultimately we had to uh, range to ship it all the way up to uh, Nevada for reassembly. Uh, this is Michelle Berman, who was running our Marine Mammal Stranding Program at the time. Uh, she was helping out on a number of days coming up and helping with the steaming. And this is just a, a, a picture of the lower jaws getting uh, steam cleaned. Uh, this is the first day of the uh, steaming the first lower jaw. And over time, as you steam these bones, uh, oil starts to leach out of them when you have the bones sitting uh, for a period of days. We had to get the oil out of the bone because you couldn't put it on exhibit. So drilling into the bone along this uh, lower side allowed us to run the uh, wand, the, steam, the tip of the steam uh, into those bones to get uh, hot steam up into the inner core of the bone, which heated up the oil and allowed it to draw, draw it out of the bone. And you see all of this oil coming out of the bone uh, when we were able to do that. And over time, after eight months, we were able to get the bone clean. So the next was repair and stabilization of the skeleton. Um, we had to harden the cancellous and soft parts of the bone, uh, repair and replace missing parts, reattach broken pieces with stainless steel rods instead of metal rods, repair the damaged bolt, bolt hose. We had to cast replicas of any of the missing bones and then seal and repaint the restored bones. So this all happened up at Academy Studios in Novato. It's just some pictures of that process going through in the Novato uh, facility. They had to strip all of that paint off of the off the bone and some of the old fiberglass and Fondo in order to get down to the actual surface of the bone because that's what you wanted to be able to stabilize was that bone and then build off of that stabilized surface. So by getting down to the bone, we could put in uh, marine epoxies, which impregnated the bone, hardened and allowed us to build up uh, and replace sections of the bone that had degraded. Um, and this shows you a stripped uh, vertebrae. And you can see all of the repairs that needed to be made and uh, rebuilt over time. So again, these are just some pictures showing that. And here's some vertebrae going through that process. Both of these have been stripped. Uh, you can see this one, uh, it's been repaired. Uh, all of the surfaces are now smooth. Uh, this one has not been repaired yet. It's still not smoothed out like this one has. Um, and then this shows what happens after you have that repaired one and you repaint it. Uh, with an uh, uh, exterior, exterior grade uh, primer. Uh, and here's one that uh, has been stripped, uh, but hasn't been uh, stabilized yet. So over time, um, eventually uh, Academy Studios finished with that repair and restoration. And then uh, the new design, uh, only two big posts uh, to hold the skeleton uh, on exhibit. Um, so the, and this is what it looked like uh, uh, in May, 2011. Uh, when it uh, was finally finished. Uh, we ended up, uh, the stats for this animal, we estimate somewhere between 80 and 100 tons uh, total body weight for the animal. It was a 72 foot sub-adult male skeleton. Um, and there are about 175 to 177 bones in the skeleton. Now, the skeleton weight is uh, about 7,600 pounds. Its uh, skull weighed uh, almost 4,000 pounds clean. Uh, the mandibles each weighed over 600 pounds each clean. And the, vertebr the vertebrae uh, vertebral column and the ribs, uh, that's about another 2,600 pounds. So what you see on exhibit today, it's about 95% of what's on exhibit today is real bone. Um, it's not uh, all uh, replicated. Uh, so uh, the existing skeleton that we have out there, Chad, is the composition of five blue whales. Uh, we have bones from five different animals now. We have the original Vandenberg specimen from the 1980s. Uh, all of the postcranial skeleton is composed primarily of uh, that original specimen. The Hobson Beach wh uh, whale that we harvested the new skull and mandibles from, that's where the skull and mandibles came from, 
And then we also had one come in at Point Magoo that we uh, necropsied a couple of months after the Hobson Beach one. We were able to recover a left ear bone, which was uh, broken, but we got all the pieces. We were able to reassemble that and have a cast replica of that ear bone uh, reconstructed and put back on the skull. And then we had another blue whale wash in at uh, Symington Cove uh, uh, a month later, um, and we were able to get the right ear bone out of that skull. And uh, then finally, the last five tail vertebrae, which we never found for the original specimen, we were able to borrow the five last tail vertebrae uh, from a, a, a blue whale skeleton that's in the collections at the LA County Museum of Natural History. Uh, and Academy Studios uh, made a cast replica of those last five tail vertebrae. And then, so we have cast bones that are on exhibit are those tail, five tail vertebrae, one and a half of the posterior floating ribs we had to re, uh, rebuild or recreate. Uh, we had to uh, cast the one ear bone that was uh, broken, the left ear bone. The two pelvic bones were originally cast uh, while the uh, original skeleton was on exhibit because people were climbing up and holding on to them and hanging from them. So uh, we had those cast in bronze and put back out on exhibit. So it now has bronze pelvic bones. And then finally, five of the finger bones uh, uh, and carpals uh, were uh, cast. So a lot of people to uh, acknowledge, but uh, in particular, I wanted to acknowledge Chuck Woodhouse and Jim Greaves uh, for all of their hard work on originally getting this specimen uh, clean, uh, re uh, reassembled and out on exhibit. They left a, a detailed legacy of notes and photographic records of that recovery, repair, and installation of the original blue whale skeleton. Um, the blue whale uh, prep crew for the new blue whale skull um, and lower mandible, Peter Gady and Michelle Berman and Laura Wilson and Krista Fay all helped out uh, during the process of preparing that skull. I want to thank the uh, folks from Simwe, which is a marine mammal uh, uh, nonprofit up at uh, the Gaviota site. Sam Dover and Ruth Dover run this uh, for allowing us to have access to do this preparation work out on the old Vista Del Mar, Mar school site. Uh, the Blue Whale Committee here at the museum that uh, did the hard work of uh, of raising the funds needed for the restoration project. And then Gary Robinson for helping out with uh, some of the equipment that we needed to get uh, fixed uh, uh, to do for preparation. Simon Allen and uh, Tony uh, Mangione uh, for help with uh, building uh, a trailer for the uh, cranium and a ramp for being able to get our equipment in and out of the uh, storage shed out of the Gaviota site. And so um, I'm gonna turn it over at this point to uh, Chris Orr our exhibits restoration specialist, uh, who's going to uh, speak next. Thank you, Paul Collins, for that incredible history. Hey, folks, thanks for tuning in. My name's Chris Orr, and I've been an exhibits tech with the Museum of Natural History since 2013. I grew up in Nebraska and Texas, and then moved out to California in the 90s. My background is in art, computer science, and then following that, prosthetics, arms and legs, and bracing, which is orthotics. And I got into that so I could make the orthotics, the braces that I use to walk in, in my everyday activities. In addition to the museum work, I also work as a trail specialist where I get to travel around the world, educating, planning, designing, and building on sustainable trails. And what that means is trails that are low impact on the environment allow the conservation of habitats and at the same time allow recreation stewardship and community to exist within those habitats. I'd like to acknowledge a couple of people, um, my prosthetic and orthotic mentors, Ralph Nobby and Dave Littig, and then of course our excellent museum staff, Paul Collins, Frank Hine, and Fris Francisco Lopez. Uh, with that, uh, we're going to go right into a incredible video that Owen Duncan, our amazing videographer for the museum has done. And here we go. Thank you. So my name is Chris Orr and I'm part of the awesome exhibits team here at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. And I focus on the blue whale exhibit, one of possibly five real bone blue whale exhibits outdoors in existence. Our blue whale exhibit is named Chad, and that comes from our Dreyer family, one of the major funders for this exhibit. Most of the men in their family have been somewhere in their name, Chad, and they wanted that part of their history with the museum. 
Our blue whale exhibit needs preservation since it's outdoors. Our old process was sending our bones off to an exhibits company and the materials they used weren't quite right for an outdoor exhibit. So because of our change in temperature, cold, fog, um, humidity, and our UV, those materials started to break down in our climate so they didn't last long. I became involved because one of the previous exhibits directors knew I had materials experience from the prosthetics industry. He figured a completely different process needed to be used outside. So he asked me, can you come up with something to help us preserve our bones? And that's what we worked on. So we're using materials that are regularly used to create prosthetic limbs and sockets that last for years and are incredibly strong for amputees. Here at the museum, we came up with a completely new process to preserve our outdoor bones, which includes sleeving the bones in some carbon fiber-like material and then epoxying them under vacuum with the UV-resistant epoxy, which we did not have before. The new materials we have are thousands of times more UV-resistant and more burst-resistant than the materials that were previously used. Our hopes is that instead of our materials lasting only a couple years, that we get 20 years at least out of the materials that we're now putting on to our blue whale exhibit. Our skeleton is interesting because of its size. So our ribs range in size from six feet long to 12 feet long, which makes this process of preserving them quite difficult. Um, heavy bones to move, have to be careful, and then we have the whale skull also, which weighs many tons, and we're not gonna be able to take down off of the exhibit like we're doing with the ribs. And we're gonna to have to come up with a separate process to do the preservation on that. We'll probably be using similar or the same materials, but since we have to do the preservation and work in place, it's gonna be a little more involved. It's gonna be like the Golden Gate Bridge. It's going to take a while because of the surface area of that skull is so big and to get our materials to dry to be able to move on to the next section is also going to take time. Did you ever think that you'd be doing a job like this? <laughs> yeah. Having a arts background and a science background I didn't think I would be working on an 80-foot blue whale skeleton named Chad, but it fits right into the materials, the shaping, and the craftsmanship stuff that I really enjoy doing. There are some pretty good emotions involved with the blue whale exhibit, especially when I go out front and the kids and the families are around and they're like, look at that dinosaur, and I'm like, well, it's actually not a dinosaur, this is a blue whale, one of the largest mammals that's ever lived. And the little kids are awesome and they come over and they touch the bones and the parents. The parents are very particular, don't climb on it, but just appreciate that. And, and the kids kind of look up in awe. And then they ask what I'm doing and we, we talk about it, some of the preservation work and they're always like, thank you, thank you for taking care of this awesome exhibit. When I get that sort of input from our families and kids, I have a lot of ownership and stewardship, and then there's also some pride for the museum because we have this awesome blue whale exhibit out in front of the museum. Thanks, Chris. That was amazing. Just always amazing to watch that happen, uh, the, the amount of work that's involved. And I want to share with you briefly kind of where we go from, from here and how the education, how we use this, this blue whale skeleton for education programming for uh, the kids, the visitors of all kinds. So the work that, that Paul and Chris do dovetails with the work that exhibits in education do out on the ground. So you see a, a shot of them just after we clean the whale looking for imperfections or anything that we need to get at or kind of put Chris on 
to keep running and keeping good shape. Um, here's an example of the way those ribs used to fail out in the field. And we really can't overstate the difference since uh, Chris has come up with his technology on, on how to make this work. Instead of lasting two years and then you know, eventually getting to the point where you saw how much work that was to get this thing rebuilt after it rotted or after it started to fall apart. So far, everything that he's done on these ribs continues to hold up. We haven't had a single failure since it started and we're really optimistic. We're gonna to get to 20 years before things really crack out and go uh, to the point where they need more intensive repairs. So staying ahead of it is kind of like staying out of the roof on your house. It's not always uh, sexy to do, but if you don't do the work, you can lose a lot inside. Uh, just a quick example of before and after. Uh, it looks like these bones on the on the left are damaged, but you know this kind of uh, fungal growth and dirt and whatever accumulates relatively quickly in our climate. As long as we stay on it and get it cleaned up on a regular schedule, we can keep it looking really just like new. And when it looks that good, we we go to the next level. Look who's helping helping us make this happen. These are the Quasar team. And these folks, this is a Francisco Lopez and a Bill in the octopus shirt there. So the first level of learning is deep. So our, our Quasar teens learn all about what Chris does, all about what Francisco does, and they physically go in and clean and do minor repairs on this skull, which gives them not just ownership into the, uh, the specimen and just the fact that it's, it's there, but also an appreciation for different ways that they might take their careers as they go down the road, regardless of where they were heading um, or where they wanna go. This just gets them really excited. And Chris works with them directly, so they really get the very definition of hands-on. But also, and actually in terms of volume, hundreds of thousands of kids over the years since this uh, blue whale has been up, hundreds of thousands have actually engaged with this, this uh, amazing specimen, but also learned uh, quite a bit because there is so much to learn about blue whale ecology. They're just fascinating and astonishing in every way. Um, and when you engage with kids at this level, uh, I'll give you an example of something fun we do, right? So you can talk about, here's the, here's the, the bones, but you know there's a lot of blubber on a whale. What is blubber like? We'll, we'll get things very tactile. So we'll put Crisco in a, in a baggie to simulate blubber. And we'll have the kids put their hands in ice cold water and like for a second, they're like, ah, too cold. And then we'll wrap it in, a, have them put on the little Crisco glove and slide it in. And they're like, well, nothing at all. We're like, yeah, exactly. So do you get what blubber is and what it does? And the lights come on and they really do understand what's going on. And over the course of all these different programs that we do, and we do many out in front, these kids start to form a bond with the whale and not just this whale, but all whales. And they begin to have a friend in the ocean. And one of my favorite shots is, is this one, which is I think the one I'm gonna close out with. This little, well, all of the kids are adorable, but this little girl just hugging that bone, just a natural embrace of the animal to our minds. And this is where it comes full circle into the mission of the organization. When you have a friend in the ocean, you don't look at the ocean the same way. When you're a kid growing up and you get to stop and look out at the water and you think about blue whales or this blue whale, you start to care. And you start to care about all kinds of things, including the ocean. And as they grow, these kids have a very special place for natural history and then the natural world in their lives. And you know, we see them again. We see them again and again as they grow up, reinforce that. And we help in that way to support natural history and the natural world uh, and kind of resolve and, and hope to resolve some of the problems that the natural world faces. And this is sort of the, the, uh, the soldiers in a making hunt on that battle. It's just uh, the, the bond that forms is amazing. And so many kids have to say goodbye to the whale on the way out. I've seen lots of kids, it's their ritual just to kiss it on the, on the, <laughs> the lips or what, you know, the tip of the bone uh, as, as they head out. And uh, it's just astonishing to see. It's an amazing thing, top to bottom. And the amount of work that, that you got to see tonight of what it took to get it here and to get it in front of that museum and kind of what, what's involved, I hope just gives us all a, a greater appreciation. I know it does for me of what it is we have here and how essential it is we take care of it. And that is really essentially what we've got here. And I know we're on deck to do a 
answer some of the questions. I believe Diane Devine is gonna field some of the questions that we've got in the, in the chat. Hi everybody and thank you very much, Frank. Uh, appreciate your time. Um, I'm Diane Elstrom Devine. I'm the development officer for the Leadership Circles of Giving program here at the museum, uh, which is an honor to be associated with this wonderful group of members. And we've really enjoyed bringing uh, a number of legends to you this last year and hopefully a few more this year. Um, it's uh, always great topics to learn about and I always learn something new myself. We thought it would be a good idea to kind of conclude the presentation with our question and answer with a little sunset behind Chad, one of our favorite photos uh, taken by our um, Director Emeritus of Facilities, Gary Robinson. So I hope you enjoy that. Let me ask all our panelists if you would come on and we'll go through some of the questions that have come up while uh, you are all presenting. Um, so Paul, one is how did you dispose of the tissue that you removed from the bones? So um, on the original uh, whale, uh, we left it on the beach and it washed away and degraded uh, in the marine environment. Um, on the Hobson blue whale where we harvested the skull and lower mandibles, uh, the county of Ventura dug big holes on the beach and buried it uh, only to have it reappear uh, within a month uh, and get washed back out on the beach and they ultimately had to reload it and haul it to the dump. <laughs> uh, for the tissue that remained on the bone after we had harvested the, uh, the skull or brought the, uh, the bones back down to the museum, uh, it, it tended to dry out while the bone sat. Uh, and then over time we had to uh, take that bone, soak it in uh, fiberglass tanks of water and rehydrate that bone. Uh, in order to soften the bone. And then through a process called maceration, where we allow bacteria to grow in the, in the tank of water, uh, the bacteria begins to digest that remaining tissue. And with uh, uh, steam from the steam cleaner, uh, we can pull a bone out and the tissue has been softened. We can steam and cook it off the surface of the bone. So that's kind of how we did it. Great. So this next question is actually multifaceted. The first part is, were insects used to clean the bones or just soaking and power washing? Um, for the bones that got left out sitting outside, yeah, they got insects all over them. Uh, things that would come in and feed on the, on the tissue. And it was like an ecosystem uh, for insects uh, that feed on dead things. You could see the varying stages of decomposition based on what insect, insects were there feeding on it at any given point in time. Huh. And so do you know how old, Chad, I'm assuming the question is for the original whale, how old that whale was? We figured it was about a 25 year old whale. So pretty young, uh, young subadult. Okay. Um, in, and in the North Pacific, these things, uh, they can get to 90 feet uh, total length. And this is only 70, 72 or 73 feet long. So it gives you an idea. Yeah, another 20 feet of growth. Uh, to, how how uh, old are, um, yeah, how old are, was the Hobson whale? Uh, it was almost exactly the same size. Uh, okay. But the uh, problem is that it, it was a subadult female. So we now have a blue whale skeleton on exhibit that has a female skull and a male uh, post cranial. <laughs> but That's luckily, really it was the same size. Yeah, very cool. Did Vandenberg help at all when you were doing the recovery of uh, the first whale? Uh, they, they helped in the, in the sense that they uh, allowed the access and our ability to be able to bring crews in and work right on the cliff. We could get off road and right, uh, right above the, uh, the whale. And they allowed that process to go on over a period of uh, six to eight weeks uh, in the recovery of that uh, skeleton. So without that access from Vandenberg Air Force Base on, on a daily basis, uh, we never would have been able to harvest the skeleton at, at that remote site. And um, let's see, which one, uh, this is for Chris actually. Chris, you with me? I don't see everybody. Yep, I'm here. Awesome. So the question is, what percentage of the skeleton has gone through the current uh, restoration process? Do you know what percentage has been completed? Um, well, the best way to describe it would be that there's 30 ribs and 24 of the ribs have gone through the process. Okay. Uh, the, the spinal column and the skull or cranium still need to go through the process. And do you know how you're going to do the skull? I know it talked about it a little bit in the video, but do you do you have an idea of how that's going to be approached? Um, besides 
working on it in place with a scissor lift, um, probably a good amount of scaffolding and some help from the rest of our awesome staff. Um, it's still yet to be determined the actual process of removing the bad material from the skull and laying down the new material. Um, okay. It may be similar to repairing dings on a surfboard, but that's about as far as we've gotten on that piece. Right now. <laughs> and uh, I was asked, did you have to protect, I'm assuming we're talking about the original bones in this question, but did you, did you have to protect the bones from crows and seagulls and rodents, that type of thing? Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, I mean, animals will uh, chew on bone and the skeleton while it's on exhibit, uh, we haven't had too much uh, degradation of the bone as a result of animals, although the birds like to nest in some of the nooks and crannies on the skeleton. So uh, that their nests after they're done nesting have to be cleaned out and any debris that they leave on the skeleton from sitting on it has to be cleaned off the surface of it. A few people have asked what you determined was the cause of death of each of the whales, Paul. So on every single blue whale that I've been on, uh, and I've been out on six blue whales uh, or eight, no, it might be seven or eight blue whales that have washed in along our stretch of coast, Santa Barbara and Ventura County. Every single one of them are ship strikes. So these large container ships or ships that move through the Santa Barbara Channel, um, when the whale, when the blue whales are in and feeding uh, on uh, blooms of cr uh, krill, these small uh, invertebrates that uh, come up to the surface. Um, if those blooms occur close to the shipping lanes, then it brings the whales into the shipping lanes and the, uh, the ships uh, can't slow down in time. Uh, and the whales don't get out of the way of these big ships and they just get uh, hit by the big ships and it breaks and crushes bone. Thank you for that. Um, is the museum still interested in getting more blue whale bones should they become available to have as a backup? I think at this this point, we're probably okay on it um, for the skeleton. We're uh, staying up with the repairs and uh, maintenance of the uh, skeleton. And I don't see the kind of de uh, long-term degradation happening to the skeleton like it did over that 27 year period where the maintenance wasn't happening on a regular basis on the skeleton. Mm -hmm. and so as long as we can stay up and current with uh, maintenance on the skeleton and make sure that the bone doesn't degrade by having surface coatings uh, coming off and exposing the underlying bone to the uh, ultraviolet radiation and moisture. Uh, I think uh, it's a good prospect. Uh, uh, existing skeleton can stay on exhibit for well over another uh, 30 to 40 years. That's awesome. It's just an amazing process overall. And I know a real learning curve. Have other museums reached out to you, to any of you in regards to our exhibit and how we're maintaining it and the process? Yeah, it's funny, you know, after we uh, did the redo on this skeleton, uh, uh, the folks up at UC Santa Cruz at the Marine Lab uh, there at UC Santa Cruz, they have a similar blue whale skeleton that they prepared and then had on exhibit, but it was on the, it was on a, a terrace right next to the, uh, the Marine Labs, which are right out next to the beach. And they had uh, similar problems with the bone degrading and breaking down. And they, they picked our brains for the kinds of materials we used in the restoration process, the techniques that we went through. Uh, and over the years after the, our whale has gone out, uh, the restored whale has gone back out on exhibit, we've had contacts from people that are, have made decisions for other organizations to harvest a skeleton. How do you prepare it? How do you clean it? <laughs> you know, how, how, how do you put it back together? <laughs> yeah. So a lot of questions. And there's a lot to be learned over the, over the process of working on these large carcasses. Uh, I know we've mentioned in, in some of our promotion of, of tonight's event that there are other museums that have blue whale skeletons, not that many. I think there are a total of five, something like that. And then you mentioned UC Santa Cruz. Are the other ones that have displays, are they indoors, do you know? Uh, there's some that are indoors and some that are outdoors but covered. Uh, so there's one down in New Zealand that uh, has been on an exhibit for a similar length of a long period of time, but it's under the eave of a building and uh, exposed to the elements uh, in the sense that it's uh, an open eave, but it has a roof over it. Yeah. And so the bone uh, is much more protected from uh, uh, the rainfall uh, coming down directly on the bone. Uh, but they had to go through a similar process of disassembling that skeleton and going through a complete restoration on it uh, to put it back out on exhibit. Um, and it was asked, where do the various isolated bones on the museum campus come from? Are they surplus from one or more of the five whales? Um, in the parking lot, we have the, uh, uh, the 
uh, large uh, parts of the skull of the existing blue whale skeleton. So the two mandibles and the cranium are in uh, areas out in the parking lot. Uh, and then around the museum grounds, we have people bring us bones uh, that they find on the beach. They get washed up on the beach, marine mammal bone and or uh, fossil whale bone uh, that uh, is in rock uh, that people have collected and they bring to us. And some of that material we put out on exhibit. It doesn't have a research value and it's a, uh, a material that can have uh, people can touch uh, and they can experience and uh, learn um, about fossil um, marine mammals and also uh, um, feel real um, bone from a large whale. And then, Paul, I thought it might be kind of fun. Um, you had told the story in one of our discussions about this presentation about when you were bringing the bones back to the museum from Vandenberg and going through the drive through to get some dinner. Do you recall? Oh, yeah. A couple of times we we were starved by the end. And it depended on the on the on the tidal cycle when, uh, on how long we had to work uh, when we got up and when we worked on. Sometimes it was the afternoon when we started working on the skeleton into the late afternoon before it got dark. And then we had to win winch ourselves out and load up and head back to the museum. And um, on those days, uh, you're pretty hungry by the time you get done and loaded into the vehicle with all these dead stinky bones. And so we're coming back into, uh, into Lompoc and we stop at, uh, at a fast food place. And <laughs> there were two times we did this. One, we stopped at a McDonald's and uh, loaded out and uh, went into McDonald's and got in line. Well, everybody in that line ahead of us and that came in behind us left. They, they, they smelled us. <laughs> We got up and got our food and came back out, loaded up in the vehicle and ate our food on the way home. Another time we, were, we had stopped and we were sitting in the, in the vehicle outside of a 7-Eleven uh, or one of those kinds of places. Uh, and these little kids come up on their, on their uh, bicycles and uh, they uh, initially ride right by us. Um, and all of a sudden one of them stops, he turns around and rides back and then he looks up at us. I, I've got the window of the truck open. I'm dry, I, I was the driver at that time. And I'm looking down at him. He goes, "What is that?" And I, I explained to him what it was that he was uh, smelling. He couldn't see into the truck; he was so short. I said, "Well, we've got these bones of a, a, a whale that we've been getting bones out of a dead, stinky whale up on the coast." And, and this little kid looks up at me and he goes, "Mister, you're gross." <laughs> <laughs> and <then> rode off. <laughs> uh, yeah, there were fun, funny stories during the process of uh, doing all this work. Yeah. Um, well, we're kind of coming to the end here of our time for everybody for the Q&A, but Luke, you wanted to um, say, make a couple comments? Yeah, thanks, Diane, and, and thank you to my colleagues for really a, a wonderful story. And a couple of standout points that I want to just pull together here is, you know, all the incredibly hard work that Chris is doing to try to slow down kind of the, the degradation of the skeleton, you know, and then Frank's comments about how we can tell such profound stories that connect people to nature through the skeleton. And there's, it's a really a very poignant metaphor, Chad is for, you know, that life is about degradation and death. And, but we're doing everything we can to slow that process down. And it really provides an opening for us sometimes to talk with visitors about, you know, it's on us to slow down the processes of degradation in natural systems that we as human beings cause. Nature works it's on its own cycle, but we've exacerbated kind of a cycle of, of damage and it's up to us to do everything we can to slow that down and by the actions we take. And so I think, you know, Chad provides a, a backdrop to tell a really profoundly important uh, story about our place in the natural world. Thank you. Well, let's our, our sincere thanks to all our uh, speakers tonight. Really appreciate your time and knowledge to Luke and Paul and Chris and Frank and uh, to help bringing this wonderful story to life for us. It was really so interesting. And I wanted to give a quick shout out to our development associate, Sarah Clement, who uh, supports these events behind the scenes. We really appreciate it. Um, if you have any additional questions pertaining to this or anything else that comes up, our 
presenters have graciously agreed to uh, field your questions via email. And you'll see the list of those emails and names on the screen right now. And of course, if you need anything else, you're welcome to or reach out to me if you needed to, the contact information again. Um, we do hope to bring a few more legends to you this year. And if there's any uh, topics that you might be interested in, uh, either an event or a person, please let me know. Uh, we'd certainly be happy to consider it. And uh, last but not least, I wanted to thank all of you again for joining us tonight uh, and for being members of the museum uh, and part of our family. We so appreciate it. And uh, we hope that you'll get to the museum soon now that our outdoor spaces are open. Fingers crossed, interiors open in the not too distant future. So thanks again for joining us tonight. Stay safe, everybody, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.